So I was in India four times, um, three times filming. And um, it was quite remarkable because we ended up really getting a mutual <laughs> understanding. Yes, there we go. Excellent. So these are some of my students and, and faculty members from Northwestern University. Today, we're gonna to talk about the process of how to build communities of trust. And my students were invited to be part of a water march in India in um, March of uh, 2010. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So for the past 30 years, I have worked to create social justice projects for social change. And this book is coming out through Rutledge, Taylor and Francis out of the UK. Um, I think the pre-order is May 16th. And what it contains are lessons and strategies that 40 colleagues and I learned through projects all over the world, in India, in China, in Mexico, in the US, of how to create social change by first building trust. This is a little different way for a documentary a producer to work. Usually producers film and then they create their, their topic. Um, I build partnerships first and then I create the social change. So what's unusual about this book is that I interviewed nine undergraduate graduate and MBA and even high school students to ask them their views about how to create social justice. And the case studies that go along with each chapter are disguised so we don't, you know, uh, step over the boundaries of, of um, the proper behavior, but the students' names are disguised. But the one about water is called water hierarchy because I saw and I've experienced the hierarchy of water, especially in India and in the US. So that chapter is um, a case study and it refers to our documentary called Water Pressures. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So, I guess the first step of the process of creating communities of trust is to discover your own social justice passion. But sometimes that passion discovers you. And it's been my experience in my career. I think I'm a kind of hard headed. So I have to be hit on the head very hard. And I was in Bangalore with my teacher who's a Tibetan Buddhist monk from India and we were in a cab on the way to the airport and all of a sudden there were roadblocks, there were burning tires, there were rioters and looters running the streets, there were fires and there were like thousands of military police just standing on the side. And I, I said to my Geshe, what's going on here? And he said, this is a water riot. And I'm from Chicago. I live near Lake Michigan, which is the Great Lakes have 26% of the world's fresh water. So I saw so I, as, as naive and stupid as I was, I said, why would anybody riot about water? You know, I don't understand. And he, he just gave me that look that your teachers sometimes give you like, oh my goodness, you've got a lot to learn. So I took out my phone, I started taking pictures and he said, no pictures, no pictures, you hide. Um, and I experienced this water riot. And on, on the flight, long flight back to Chicago, I kept seeing these images again and again and hearing my teacher's voice saying, the poor people, are protesting because there is um, a case in front of the Supreme Court about the Covery River and who has rights to the headwater, which is the good stuff, and who gets the dregs at the bottom, who gets what's ever left. And of course, the wealthy and the powerful get the rights to the head and, and the poor get what's left at the bottom. 
And I knew nothing about water. I had no experience, absolutely nothing, but that has really never stopped me before. So I thought, what, why should I care? And then what can I do? So why should I care? Um, I'm a mother of, I have also four grandchildren. I've learned from my students at Northwestern. I've always had interns for, oh, two dozen years. And I thought, this is your future. So let's go on to the next page, please. Um, the, the one before, please. Thank you. So I started this project called Water, Water Pressures. And it was really based on what can we do for the future of 12 to 40 year olds? And I started to look at the statistics and they were horrifying. So one in nine lack safe water, one in three lack access to a toilet. By 2050, 2050, we're in 2022, not so far away, 57% of the world will experience water scarcity. Now, 2050 is not going to affect me. And it may not affect some of the older people on this call, but it is going to affect you students. And so I keep saying to my students, water is your future and you need to get involved. It is the single most critical issue in your future in both work and at home. Uh, today, people, don't necessarily work near their homes. They may work in another country and you will experience water scarcity and water compromised uh, situations either at home or in work. So you need to get involved in your future. And that's what today is about. So if we go to the next slide, what can you do once you have found your passion? So we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so the second thing you do is you find like-minded people to share your interests. They don't have to be like you. They just have to kind of share your vision. Let's go back to that one uh, before, the slide before, please. So what I did was, you can see on the left, I brought students and faculty from my college, Northwestern University in Illinois, to the deserts of Rajasthan, India, to meet with the Jal Bahagarathi Foundation, which is a very famous foundation run by the Maharaja and trustees. And um, I had already filmed at their location three times. I had worked with the Maharaja, I had worked with the engineers going out into the desert, and I had brought my film crew. But what um, the trustee and I decided was that the most critical thing was to make an exchange. So the U United Nations Development Program actually supported for my students and faculty to come over to India and for the leadership from India to come to the US to the campus. And then I took them to meet with members of Congress. Okay. Let's advance this please to the next slide. So the third step, okay, you've got your concept, you've got your partners, is to create the kind of social change you want to see. So um, the trustee on the left is, is Prithvi Raj Singh, and he, he's got a very funny sense of humor. He, he laughs at me a lot because I make a lot of mistakes. And um, I came a little early for the partnership with the students. I came before the students just to make sure everything was set up. And Prithi says to me at a meeting with all of his partners, we're going to change. We're not going to have the students in a classroom. We're going to make the desert the classroom. We're going to give them experiential learning, at which point I burst into tears because I had already promised the university that the students were going to be in classes and I didn't really understand what was he saying and my students don't speak Hindi. Oh my goodness, all my worries. And so he still laughs at me for making that error. Let's go back. 
So what, what he wanted was for the students, even though they didn't speak the language, there's Andrea and one of the women elders, finding something in common to laugh about. He wanted them to connect as human beings. So he had the students shadow the elders and we lived overnight in the desert for 36 hours. And I think the thing that they learned, the students and I learned, was to be humble before these great teachers that could take a little teeny glass of water and make that last for the whole day. They could use a little teeny glass of water for cooking. You know, it was a humbling experience from these smart students at Northwestern to see that they had a lot to learn from these desert dwellers. So we met with the desert dwellers, with nurses, with doctors, and it was quite a remarkable experience. We slept on the roofs of the houses. Um, the villagers gave us their food. We went to a Hindi ceremony at, at midnight. It was remarkable. But as in any new situation, there was conflict. And I want you to see the next slide is, um, shows the conflict that we experienced in India. If you can advance the slide, please. Um, two of my students did not, they, they were engineers and they did not like this experiential learning. And I will let the Western peace students for itself. In the desert. Go ahead, you can start. Yeah, may I go ahead with the video? Yes, please. Go ahead. The Northwestern students study in the desert communities. Chris Plant explains the big questions he believes Northwestern students should ask. Come away with a lot. But it's an excellent question. Why am I here? And the answer is, I'm here to learn. It's, it's, a, it's something that you'll probably need to understand and probably need to absorb. Everything that has been told us so far is experience, learn, understand, very liberal arts sort of stuff. I didn't come here to just, just experience things. I came here to do things. Not once have, has it been mentioned that we're going to do something. Mert and Yuri decided to leave for two days. They want to create an engineering design partnership with the Barefoot College. Yet the students have different goals for what they want. I think everybody's interpreting the trip differently. I think some students sort of need to step outside of themselves a little bit more and sort of lose their sense of self and more realize that they have limited time being here. And the focus should be on consuming as much information as possible. It's kind of funny when you get a bunch of kids from Northwestern who are very, you know, go-getters, want to get things done, do things, create things, and like see something happen, see like a tangible thing happen. I feel like if you're coming to India on a trip for maybe 10 days, I think it's not really possible for that to happen. It's incredible. It's incredible. Tensions flare as students weigh in with their own opinions of Mert and Yuri's decision. But I would not be able to live with myself if, if I just, just see this and then go back to Northwestern and act like this was a dream. These are people. They're suffering. How can we not do anything about this? Andrea explains her perspective on how the Jal Bahagarathi Foundation views the students and their mission. I don't think that they, they, they feel like we have nothing to offer. Absolutely not. But I think they're more concerned about us getting the problems right, you know, versus going back and trying to come up with solutions. I don't think you can go into... I feel like if you're coming to India on a trip for maybe 10 days, I think it's not really possible for that to happen. It's incredible. It's incredible. Tensions flare as students weigh in with their own opinions of Mert and Yuri's decision. But I would not be able to live with myself if, if I just, just see this and then go back to Northwestern and act like this was a dream. These are people. They're suffering. How can we not do anything about this? Andrea explains her perspective on how the Jal Bahagarathi Foundation views the students and their mission. I don't think that they, they, they feel like we have nothing to offer. Absolutely not. But I think they're more concerned about us getting the problems right, 
you know, versus going back and trying to come up with solutions. I don't think you can go into a situation like this with that, with such a narrow-minded narrow-minded way of looking at what you're going to get out of this experience. Why else do you think we have JBF, you know, setting all this up for us? We're setting up a foundation for future things to happen. Okay. That's okay. You can advance to the next slide. Yeah. That's okay. I'll explain it. Um, so what happened was, uh, you can see kind of Priya Harish is the executive director of the Jabal Foundation. This caused a lot of problems because our hosts, were insulted by the behavior of the students. And the other students who were told that they were not allowed to leave the campus were also upset. Um, we, the campus of Jabhagrathi Foundation is right at the border with Pakistan. And there were, there were military skirmishes back and forth at that time. So for the students' safety, they were not supposed to leave. Um, my students had signed an agreement that they would stay with us. And I called back to the university and said, what should I do? And they said, put them on a plane, send them home, and they'll have a black mark. Um, I talked to some of the other teachers. I talked to my uh, guru. And we decided the students could go off but that we would take this as a learning experience. I was not going to ruin their future over this decision. But what we learned was that in order to really build communities of trust, things have to break. I will say that again. In order to really build communities of trust, trust has to break. It's the rebuilding that makes it strong. So, um, I worked closely with Kanapriya Harish. I worked closely with the students. My film crew took every single one of the other students aside and filmed them talking about what their feelings were. And those students wanted to go in the desert. And <coughs> the students who stayed, this was the experience of a lifetime, really truly to live in the desert with the villagers, with the engineers there, with the nurses. Um, and to have this all documented by the film crew was quite extraordinary. And what happened because of this, because we had this experiential learning is um, when we came back to the US, we got incredible new partners. Um, one partner actually came to join us in the desert and that was IBM. Because IBM is really, um, you know, it's a global company. They're interested in water issues. They have a, a whole thing called Students for a Smarter Planet. And they support actually my student, the student engineers at Northwestern for some of their projects. We also got Bono's One.org involved and brought um, the documentary and the project to 200 campuses across the country. I spoke at Columbia University Water Center, the uh, UNC Water Center, uh, the United Nations and PBS Learning Media used our documentary and discussion guide all over the world for teaching. PepsiCo became a partner. Um, we expanded student involvement and we had all kinds of events at Northwestern and as I said, we brought the leadership of the Jal Bahagrathi Foundation to Chicago. So even though trust was broken, it was rebuilt in a stronger way. Let's, let's go to the next slide, please. That the roles started to change. The students who were supposed to be students started to take leadership like those two boys, very smart boys, young men. The other students started to stand up and say what their views were, which is not a typical situation for students who are on a 10 day field trip. The leadership of Jal Bahagarathi, including Prithvi said to me, you know, your students want to do something and here's an example I will give you. We have people from all over the world and all over different companies come to us and say, we want to send our 
you know, young um, engineers and, and um, technical experts into your, into your uh, desert situation and solve your problems. And um, Prithvi has a very good sense of humor. He laughs and he says, okay, well, I'm going to send my engineers and my villagers into um, your company. And the head of the company says, but they don't speak the language, but they don't live here, but they don't know how our company works. And Prithvi says, exactly. And so Frank, to your question is, when things go wrong, you have the opportunity, you can walk away, it can break apart, or you can have honest discussions. And the honest discussion was, the students want to do something, but like Andrea said, they don't know enough about the situation to do something. Now she came back afterward and wrote a big article for the internet about water sustainability. And that was her contribution. But until you have these kind of honest discussions where you know, the leadership of JBF says, you know, you're here to learn. And the students say, we don't know enough to do anything yet, but we want to do something. And they try and figure out the path of how to do something that would actually benefit all the parties. I think that that's one of the big things about building trust is too often outsiders come in with a vision and good-minded and good-hearted people come in with this vision to help make positive social change, but they don't know what they're getting into and they don't know what the community wants and they don't know what the community needs. When Jal Bahagrathi goes into a village and, decide, and they decide with the villagers that they need to make a well, the villagers put up, I think, 40% of the funds. They do the sweat equity, they dig the holes, they monitor the site for cleanliness. You know, it's a true partnership. And I think that that's changed. Is that a decent answer, or at least a decent start to answer your question, Frank? Raj just taught me very excellent lesson, lessons of patience and trust. And it's, um, this is serious. This is a covenant. Do you know what I mean when I say a covenant? This is a, a sacred promise. Yep. There is a reason I was caught in a water riot. There is a reason that a little 70, you know, that an old woman from Chicago was caught in a water riot in India. This was not of my doing. And once I recognized it, then, then I made a promise to see this through without people getting hurt in the process. And I didn't want Mert and Yuri hurt in the process either. Um, if we go back to the Amplify slide, I think that the advantage that we have that I have uh, Raj knows I've been preaching this for a long time, is I really, really believe that organizations need to get smarter about media. <clears throat> and it's the young people that will help us do that, that will give us the tools to make media that isn't just preaching, but is incredibly exciting storytelling. And so um, I believe in the power of media to amplify the message. It was one thing to take, you know, these few students and faculty into the desert. So maybe we had, you know, 200 people involved or a thousand people. But when you make a documentary, and this was in the United States, it was in India, it was in Australia and Canada, in Europe, um, PepsiCo uh, broadcast the Water Pressures documentary in all of their offices all over the world. Um, when it can reach millions instead of hundreds or thousands, then you have, then you have something worthwhile because we can work hard, all of us, to build trust. But if it keeps precious in our own little community, it's not a big enough lesson. 
we need to use every single tool. And the young people know probably full-length documentaries are not the answer. Um, sizzle reels, two minutes, one minute, TikTok, um, Twitter. You know, there's, there's all kinds of new media that are way beyond me, but are, are the bread and butter of our young people who are on this call. So they're the ones we need to turn to. Um, the other thing is that sometimes when you get a celebrity, we had a pretty famous actor who narrated this, that they bring in people. And then you apply for awards. This one um, won a lot of awards, but amplify your message through media. Okay, let's advance, please. Let's advance this slide, please. Thank you. So again, to the young people, let's go back one, please. The water future is yours. It's not mine. So please ask yourself these questions. Take a snapshot. What's your water social justice project? What would you do if you, if you could? I mean, I did it. If I could do it, anybody can do it. Who is in your community of trust or who can you invite into your community of trust? What social change do you want to see? What problems have you experienced and what are your solutions and strategies for success? And like Frank said, it is a long process. And then how do you amplify your message to others? Let's go to the next slide, please. One, uh, yeah. So what my students did was they started campaigns. Some of the students did a campaign nationally to invite students to only buy used blue jeans. Blue jeans use, they're one of the biggest water wasters, um, the production of blue jeans. Um, I think micro, uh, the Intel chips are the biggest wasters or users of water, but blue jeans are pretty high up there. And so my students made a national campaign instead of buying new blue jeans to only buy used blue jeans. Um, you see a picture here, do you see Mert on the side? He helped design a water saving dishwasher for the dorms in the, on the campus, which saves a huge amount of water. So these are very practical campaigns. I had another student do a cleanup campaign for her lake in Southern Illinois. She'd take her dog down there to play and the dog got sick every single time because the water was polluted. So she decided to do a campaign. So, you know, you find your passion, you find the project, and then you need to post blogs, videos, podcasts, and I would really love it if you would share those with me. Um, you can contact me at this address at Twitter. You can post and tweet me and, and I'll retweet. But this is the, I think the best way to share message and actions. Without action, this is just a lot of talk. And talk isn't going to get us anywhere except feeling good about ourselves. We need to feel very uncomfortable. I am very uncomfortable about what we're facing in terms of the water future. And I, I ask you all to take action and inspire others. Let's go to the last slide, please. So I wanna thank everyone again Thanks to Dr. Haran and to Payali Jane and to the trust for inviting me. Thank you all for taking your time to come here. And I'm looking forward to your questions and I'll see if I can answer. I sort of can answer questions uh, as you can see from my reply to Frank. This is a process, it isn't a quick fix. Um, thank you very much.